Well, welcome. It's good to be together here on this Father's Day. So we want to especially say a word about Father's Day. Father's will show up in the in the study later uh, for a little bit. But uh, to uh, uh, welcome our fathers, the ones that are here, and others that will watch this uh, somewhere later on, and uh, celebrate fathers, affirm fathers uh, today. Uh, we live in a, a time when uh, fathers aren't uh, universally affirmed. Do you think it'd be hard to be unhappy about the role of fathers? I mean, uh, you know, I mean, if they fail, but just being fathers in our culture, uh, they're you know they're people of significance uh, uh, that would say, well, uh, fathers are unnecessary and useless, really, I mean, other than kind of producing the children. But in terms of raising children, that they're uh, uh, sort of optional, and others who go further and say, actually, it's a, it's a bad thing. They want to get the fathers away. We're better off if there aren't fathers. So we get to a, a number of mixed messages from our culture, but we don't get a mixed message from Scripture. And uh, God says, this is how I organize this. Now, you may not always get it right. You may not always uh, uh, fulfill the role that I'm calling you to as fathers, but uh, God says, I've, I've designed this and it's good. And uh, so uh, we appreciate the fathers and realize that, uh, you know, uh, God is the only one who is perfect. And uh, uh, as fathers, uh, you know, some do better than others, but none of us get it right. But uh, the fact that we have fathers that are hanging in there trying to get it right it makes uh, makes this uh, community, makes this world a better place. And so we celebrate that. And so in our opening prayer today, I just want to include uh, fathers and uh, thanksgiving and the uh, word of uh, intercession for them. Lord, on this day, we are mindful of fathers. Some, some of us have come from celebrations or phone calls or uh, commemorations in one way or another. Uh, but uh, we're uh, mindful that uh, that isn't always the case. And uh, there are fathers today who are alone. There are fathers today who are separated, ostracized, or indifferent to their children, not the, not the way you planned it. There are broken relationships and uh, conflict. Lord, we just pray today that you would, uh, by your spirit, be present to uh, fathers and uh, the folks that fathers impact and influence, and that you would be a means of grace and encouragement today. And uh, we thank you for uh, the positive roles that uh, fathers have played and play in our lives and our community. And we recognize that uh, you have uh, designed well. We ask that you would help us, fathers and those who fathers influence, to live uh, into and up to the plan that you designed for us. We ask that you help us tonight that as we look into your word and spend time together, that uh, you would help us to do exactly that, to move as a people toward you, uh, into your presence, toward the place where uh, we will be, where your blessings dwell and uh, please you. And so, Lord, you work among us tonight, and uh, we thank you uh, in advance for what you're going to do, because uh, we know you're, you're a good God, you, and you always do, do well. So we thank you tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we're going to have a song, we're going to a song tonight, Liz is going to lead us in a song about the songs of ascent this week, this hymn came to my mind. It's not one of the songs of ascent from the Bible, but it has kind of that, that same idea. And hopefully it's familiar to everybody. Most of you don't sing the ones that are in the Bible, but uh, mm -hmm. no, most of you don't sing the ones that are in the Bible, but we sing hymns, and so that's what this one made me think of. Yeah. 
form our minds and our hearts and shape our lives to reflect you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is a psalm with a particular kind of message, and, and uh, we get to, uh, really the introduction to the uh, character of this message uh, right up front in the first two verses. They have greatly oppressed me from my youth, and then this uh, mechanism again, we've seen it before. Let Israel say, in other words, let me, let me repeat that one more time. You didn't get the first time. Let me say it again. They have greatly oppressed me from my youth. And as this psalm, this psalm is addressing folks who have experienced a, 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 a category of a harm or hurt or woundedness or injustice or brokenness that is uh, a different, it's more than just uh, an occasion. You know, we've all had occasions or instances when someone has been unkind to us or said something really ugly or uh, treated us in an unfair way. And those are bad enough, but there are other, there's another category of experience that, uh, that, we, that we often have, uh, most if not all of us, and that is a, an experience of a kind of brokenness or woundedness, a hurt that is ongoing. It's a kind of hurt or woundedness that digs deep and continues to be at work in our life. That pressed me from my youth. Now, uh, it doesn't have to be a particular person, uh, whoever they are, they have greatly oppressed me from my youth. Uh, it doesn't have to be a particular person. We don't have to identify like the agents of that in our society or in, in our community in some way. It, it's referring, though, to this kind of experience where we have uh, experienced a, a broken a kind of interaction. And it could be with particular people. It could be uh, with uh, situations in our lives. Uh, it, it could be with a, a kind of a woundedness in our experience that continues to uh, be painful and to be an open wound and harmful to us. It, it could be a kind of, uh, a, a, a limitation or uh, something about us that continues to uh, uh, bring harm. Uh, you know, folks that uh, look a little funny, or they're a little short, or I hesitate to, but you know what I mean. They're, they're things, they're attributes, they're qualities. Maybe it's the way they talk. Maybe, maybe it's the, their eyes are crossed. Uh, maybe it's uh, who their families are. Maybe it's how they dress. You know what I mean. There, there are things that, that, that folks have in their experiences, or uh, attributes that they have. They're, there are things that are a part of who they are that attach to that from their youth, that is through, through life, that are, are harmful and hurtful. Now, uh, you know, it's possible if you don't get this, so, and if you don't, God bless you. You know, there are folks that grow up, you know, and their the guys are good looking and the girls are beautiful and uh, they always score well and everybody likes them and life is good and don't get sick and they always know success and uh, I'm assuming there are people like that I don't know because that's <laughs> not my experience. I, I, I get exactly what the psalmist is saying. There are things in life that aren't just a moment or a time or an interaction but dig deep and wound us. So some of us walk with the limp. We don't all come from the same place. You know, uh, it's, it's just the way it is. Uh, but some folks, uh, and uh, we can be happy, we come from a better uh, kind of situation where they uh, grew up with different environment, really probably none of them perfect, but uh, there, there are degrees. And uh, uh, other folks that have to come from behind uh, situations and circumstances in their lives. I think of my mother. She was uh, uh, badly abused as a child emotionally by her father. Uh, 
whatever it was that just at times would make him just immensely cruel. And uh, she was a sensitive kid trying to do the right thing. And uh, that oppressed her from her youth. It, it led her in later years to lots of other things. And it's not a unique story. Uh, the places we find ourselves in. Now, the, the, the second part of that opening statement, that kind of identifying kind of where we're at here and what this says, uh, they, been, they have greatly oppressed me, let me say it again in case you missed the first time, they have greatly oppressed me from my youth. And here's the good part. But they have not gained the victory over. That is, we don't, in, in God's uh, uh, world, in, in uh, God's plan, we, we don't have to let those circumstances define us and determine who we're going to be or where we're going to go or the limits to what we can accomplish. Uh, we, we may walk with a limp, uh, but that doesn't mean we can't be in the race. And uh, this is what Psalmist is saying. We are not bound by the oppression that we may have experienced all through our lives or from certain points in our lives that just uh, works its way into us. That doesn't have to be the end of the story. We can still be walking. Now, the psalmist elaborates a little bit more about this, and he gives us a, a couple of word pictures. Uh, the first set in uh, verses 3 and 4, and then the second in verses 5 through 8. And uh, the image in verses uh, 3 and 4 is so powerful that it's painful to read uh, to, when you're gay. I mean, you just read through it. But if you read it and hear it, Plowmen have plowed my back and made their furrows long. That is, that is just uncomfortable to think about. He's mixing his sort of metaphors, right? So he's mixing the image of a plowman in the field. You know, those, the, I don't really know, except see that, you know, in those days they'd have an ox, big hefty ox, uh, hooked to a plow and uh, in those days, it would have been a primitive plow, but all the plows are designed to use the, the, the force of that beast to dig deep, to turn the ground so that you can till it. And he's mixed that image with an image of his own experience and using his back. Wow, that is, that is a, oh, painful to think of plows, that plow just working its way up our back, and it's uh, uncomfortable to read, uh, but uh, the reality is uh, some of us know that experience. Where life, experiences of life, sometimes people, sometimes circumstances, events, have just gone to work on us in a way that that just digs deep and creates a furrow. It just, it just uh, turns it up, leaves a mark, leaves a wound and scars and it doesn't just go away. Once it digs that deep, why it's painful and it and it leaves a mark. And we know some of us what that feels like. What a, what a powerful, awful image. There are things that can happen, things people can do or say that continue through our lives to be like that plow, just working not on our backs, really, but on our spirits, our souls, our very sort of self, plowing painfully deep, leaving those marks. Well, we can relate, some of us can relate to that experience, and uh, the world we live in knows all about it. You, you don't have to go very far and talk to people before you hear people talking about what, what has happened to them, or what somebody said, or the fact that they they have this disease, or they have some problem that they, they it won't let them, they can't speak right, or whatever it is that, 
that uh, defines them and limits them in a, in a, in a hurtful way and uh, that it just continues to define them. Uh, but uh, this scripture says, uh, Common had plowed my back and made their furrows long, but, it's the second, but the Lord is righteous and he has cut me free from the cords of the wicked. I love that image. Uh, cutting the cords, that is, that is uh, uh, removing their power to dig deep anymore. Uh, the, what, a, what a liberation. There are folks that have lived long with folks having the power to dig deep into them. Things that have happened. And uh, it digs deep. And for the Lord to come and just snip those cords and all of a sudden they don't have the power to produce that pain anymore. What a, what a wonderful image. Well, I want to uh, take a, a side note here, because uh, I'm thinking about fathers, and this text is not about fathers, but it, it applies to fathers. And uh, uh, the fathers and their roles to children are uh, often uh, difficult and sources of for us. Uh, it's an important relationship. You know, don't leave, usually hear it with mothers, but with fathers. You do. Uh, uh, years ago, um, back at North Raleigh, uh, but we were coming up on a Father's Day, so I wanted to do a little thing, have some of the ladies come up and give little stories, tell, tell about their experience with their father. I thought it would be a nice thing to do. I'd have three come up who had different kinds of experience. You know, one that maybe had a broken relationship with the father or, or uh, didn't know a father or something and had come to uh, some kind of uh, redemptive resolution uh, in her life uh, to, for different people to be able to connect. And one of them, I thought, well, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to get one of the ladies that has a really great relationship with her father and come up and tell about what a, what a great relationship she had with the father. We were, we were probably running, I don't know, 250 then. Lots of young families. People that had, uh, many of them had grown to the church. I could not find one, no, I didn't ask everybody. I thought it would be easy. You know, I picked a couple of people up. I knew that they you know, had come from a good family. I said, hey, I just need somebody to tell me the, the, the good story. Couldn't find one. Now, uh, besides being depressed as a father, it just it, it just reminded me this, this is a difficult kind of relationship that that often uh, is uh, even in good relationships has this sort of mixed character to it and can leave a marks uh, that last a lifetime. I mean, men uh, successful and uh, who, who achieved, and yet years, years later, they keep hearing their father in their ear saying, "Son, you're never going to amount to anything. You're, you're just going to be a failure." And they, they keep trying to prove to their dad, and of course, he's dead. They can't go back and persuade him. But they remember that. And those furrows, they just keep getting dug. I want, I, for folks like that, I want to hear this text. God can cut, uh, can cut the strings on those wounds and uh, break their power and can set us free. And uh, that's a word to folks about Father, but also two fathers. This is an all-complex relationship, isn't it? Part of it is uh, fathers themselves struggling with the responsibility of being fathers and what that means. I, I remember another uh, Father's Day, we were coming up for Father's Day, and one of our leaders, you'd know who it was, and you'd be surprised if I told you his name. A guy that, we would, that you would say, oh, he's a really 
He's a model husband and father. He's a really great guy. And one day he said to me, you know, Pastor, I always dread Father's Day. I dread it. Uh, and I don't know exactly what he said, but the gist of it was he would be reminded on that day how far short he fell. Now, some of us tied to his own father. He had had a problematic relationship with his father and it never was resolved, but it wasn't just that. It was, it, it was a source of, it was a furrow. I'm not, I'm not getting it right. I'm not, I'm not doing what I should do. I'm, I'm failing. And the message of this psalm saying to fathers that God can cut those cords and set them free. And he can do that because whether we, uh, our father has uh, you know, not been, has failed us, or whether we feel like we failed as fathers, we all together have a father who never fails, who, who is the perfect father. And when we can't do it, we, we know that he, our, our children, for us fathers, our children have a perfect father. It's not us, but they have a perfect father. And for those of us who have not had a, a perfect father, and uh, I, um, I, I take too long explaining what it's going on. Uh, and God bless him, but I have a perfect father too, who knows and understands, who fills all of the expectations and dreams about what a father should be, and he can cut those cords and set us free from that furrow being dug in our lives. That's a, that's a great word, great promise about fathers and to fathers. Well, this, this text goes on because as we've seen before in these texts, they, they don't just stop with the kind of remedy. So the text doesn't stop with relief, you know, uh, uh, stopping your pain relieving you from the ongoing uh, digging of that furrow. He, he cuts those cords and it doesn't have power over you anymore, but you still have a furrowed back. You still, you still are damaged goods. And you're not continuing to experience that damage, but you know you, you, you are damaged goods. You're, you're broken. You're, something has happened to you, who you are, whatever it is. And you know you just can't go back and undo that. Our, the problem for us is uh, that in, in, uh, in our society, we don't value furrowed backs. You know what I mean? I mean, so, uh, you know, you ever had anybody, uh, you guys, that, you know, that somebody says, oh, I got this uh, perfect uh, blind date, and, and uh, now she's a little beat up. Or she's uh, had a hard life, or she's weathered, or she—you know—nobody says that because we we, we don't we don't want them. <laughs> you know, we work really hard to look like we have never had a hard experience in our lives. Why, why do you think that the the whole uh, makeup business and all that is is like multi-billion-dollar business in our com country? Because we don't want to show up looking like we've had a hard life. We don't want the lines. We don't want the wrinkles. We, we don't want the signs that are left over of having to struggle through issues in life. What we, what we want to see is like the perfect, uh, uh, un, unmarred appearance of someone like they've been kept in a, in a cabinet all their lives and we just bring them out to look at them for a little bit and put them back. I mean, it's, it seems silly, but it's, it's, it's the way we like it. I remember one time at a youth thing, they were talking about, uh, they had a, a cover, a magazine cover, this was years ago, and a, a beautiful uh, actress, I think like Michelle Pfeiffer or something like that, and a beautiful woman. Uh, but when they put her picture on the, the cover of that magazine, they spent like $35,000 fixing her up, because <laughs> it wasn't good enough. That's bad news for the rest of us, isn't it? 
<laughs> I don't know what my bill would be. Uh, $35,000, and it's just to, because what? Because we didn't want to say like blemishes or signs of aging or whatever. Our society doesn't value that, and yet here we are. And so the rest of this, the rest of this a psalm it really addresses that for us and, and should help us to reposition our thinking about those furrowed backs. Now, how it's stated in the text uh, is, I think, misleading. So it, it should be understood, uh, be understood better as, as a statement of how things are in the kingdom, not as it sounds like it's a, a prayer or asking for something to be in a certain way, but when, uh, when really it's, uh, it's a statement of the way things are, really, and certainly in the kingdom. So uh, all who hate Zion uh, will be put back, will turn back in shame. I'm editing a little bit. They will be like grass on the roof, which withers before it can grow. And with it the reaper cannot fill his hands, or the one who gathers fill his arms. And those who pass by will not say, the blessing of the Lord is upon you, must be on, upon you. And you're blessed in the name of the Lord. So what's the point of that? Well, he's using a second image now. It's not the furrow back. Now it's the grass on the roof. And houses, as I'm sure you know, in that part of the world have flat roofs. They don't have a really big rain problem there. <laughs> they have flat roofs, and then they have, uh, like, uh, sticks and wood and whatever. And then over that, they put soil, a layer of soil. It's, uh, uh, it's good insulation from the sun. So, uh, uh, I don't know what the R value is, but, but they've got a layer of soil on the roof there. And, because the soil there, then the, it, it gathers uh, seeds. And when they do have some kind of uh, uh, rain, guess what happens? The seeds sprout. And when they sprout, that roof looks like the yard I've always wanted. You know, flat, grass coming up perfect. Uh, you know, we've got a, a set of a, a croquet in our garage. I don't know, the box. I can't find a place in our yard where I've got a flat enough yard place where I can play croquet. But boy, if you had one of those roofs, that would be like a championship croquet uh, field. Flat, perfect, just like you'd want it to be. Just what we think we want. But what he's, what he's saying, really, and pointing out is, while that is really pretty, it's not productive at all. Now, you can go up and look, and after they have some kind of condensation, then the, the seeds will grow up, and you can see a little lawn there. But it doesn't last, and it, isn't, it doesn't produce anything, because there's not enough depth there. So nobody's going to go by and say, wow, what a great crop you got from here. Look at that field of wheat. Boy, the Lord has blessed you. Not going to happen. Because that little bit of soil on that roof, it's pretty. But it's not enough to produce a harvest. You know what is really good to produce a harvest is a furrowed field. You, you want to really have a harvest in uh, farming. You got it. That's why they do that. But the point isn't about agriculture. If you want to have a harvest in your life, you know what God can use to really produce a harvest is that field of furrows that you regret, that you maybe resent, that you wish would go away, that we could find some kind of super makeup. <laughs> that would make it all look, look uh, level and cool, and we wouldn't look like we've been beat up. And God is saying, that's exactly what I can use to make your life productive. All those, that brokenness, those furrows that life has dug out in, in you, if you'll let me, I can produce a harvest. And that's when people will go by and say, Look at that field of wheat. You are really blessed. Well, boy, you don't know what's under that wheat. 
No, it's what God uses to produce a harvest. It is the very thing that, that, we, that in our society we, we consider uh, the, the thing that makes us less than other people or uh, not as good looking or not as uh, all together or not as something. It's exactly that that God uses to produce a rich harvest in our lives. We, we, we really don't want that uh, roof lawn. <laughs> it's the other thing that God can take and use and he makes a harvest come if we let him. And so God not only relieves us of the, the pain and the suffering, he, he not only stops that, but he turns it around and he turns that very thing into the means of grace that he uses in our lives and through our lives. Isn't it amazing what God does with all the stuff we didn't want in the first place? And he, and he turns it into something extraordinary. So the, the lesson is uh, kind of back to that beginning. Furrowed backs and all, we may be limping, but we are marching on the way. I've been thinking this week, the image that comes to mind, I haven't thought about it in a long, long time, but there, there was a show years ago, you guys are too young to remember, but I think it was called The Real McCoy's. It was probably black and white when I was a kid. And uh, Walter Brennan was on there. He was the grandpa, and he, he walked with a hitch. We, we may be walking with a hitch, but we're right, going right up to Jerusalem. And uh, if we have our right minds about us, we're not embarrassed about it at all. Say, you know, this hitch is what's getting me there. This hitch is the evidence of what uh, has happened in my life that God has used. So I'm not going to hide it or be embarrassed about it at all. I'm just going to limp my way right into the presence of God in the center of his blessings. Because I may have been oppressed since my youth. But it has not overcome me. It's a great word. Well, I want to close with a prayer tonight. Just thinking, you know, uh, there may be cords that we need to ask God to cut. It keeps, it keeps working and wounding. And we need to say, Lord, I can't do it, but if you can, if you can turn me loose so that I can release it to you, maybe you need to forgive. Just release the uh, vindication or the, uh, the justice. Say, Lord, you 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 work, you handle this. He actually can, you know, work it out. But Lord, I'm going to release this to you, and I'm going to quit dragging it along, and you cut that cord. Or maybe we we've got those furrows, and we we come to terms with them, but we we're embarrassed by them, or we regret them. And uh, the, the God, through the psalmist, is trying to say that that's, you need to you need to just embrace those and say, Lord, you just you just use this plowed field and do what you can do with it, because He can produce the harvest, and to rejoice in it, and to be willing to walk with that man all the way home if, if we let Him bless us. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the word from the psalmist tonight, which we hear as a word from you. It gives us a word of uh, testimony of triumph, if we can claim it, that even if we have been oppressed from our youth, even if we have experienced difficulties that, that have uh, been uh, harmful to us, uh, we we uh, can still keep walking. And Lord, it, it may be that there's a, a, a plow that needs to be unhooked, a cord that needs to be cut. Sometimes, Lord, we just, we hold on to those experiences and um, whatever it is about them, we, we, we hold on to it and because we do, because it's the natural way of things, we, 
we continue to experience that furrow cutting into our soul, spirit, and life. Lord, would you give us the courage to trust you and to turn it over to you and let you just cut those cords and set us free. And then, Lord, uh, that you might work with blessing in our weakness, brokenness, inadequacies, shortcomings, failings, 